Hi, everybody. Welcome to our third lockdown event here at the Cambridge Union. Today, we have a really exciting panel event about the ways forward in Yemen from participants from Doha to Washington in collaboration with the Cambridge University Yemen Society and the Cambridge University Arab Society. I encourage all of you watching to submit questions to our panelists with the link that I've posted in the chat, and you can also find it at tinyurl.com slash camyemquest, that's Q-U-E-S. I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight um, in the order they'll be speaking. First, Dr. Nadia al sakaf was Yemen's first female Minister of Information and Mass Media. She was the editor-in-chief of the Yemen Times from 2005 until 2014. She fled Yemen in 2015 after the coup and is currently an independent researcher in politics, media, development, and gender studies based in the UK. Ambassador Gerald Firestein is the senior vice president of the Washington-based Middle East Institute. He retired from the US Foreign Service in 2016 as a principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs after a 41 year career during which he served as a diplomat in nine overseas postings including three tours of duty in Pakistan, as well as assignments in Saudi Arabia, Oman, Lebanon, Jerusalem, and Tunisia. In 2010, Gerald was appointed by President Obama to be U.S. Ambassador to Yemen, where he served until 2013. Dr. Ibrahim Freyhat is an international conflict resolution professor and dean at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and Georgetown University. He previously served as Senior Foreign Policy Fellow at the Brookings Institution and taught International <gasps> Conflict Resolution at George Washington University and George Mason University in Washington, D.C. He has published extensively on Middle East politics with articles appearing in publications such as the New York Times, Financial Times, Foreign Affairs, and Al Jazeera. Galal Mankatri is a writer and social scientist from Yemen and a researcher at LSE. He is also a co-founder and director of the Independent Yemen Group, a UK-based NGO, which along with international NGOs, campaigns for a democratic Yemen. His main research interest is in the political sociology of Yemen, as well as developments in the Gulf region and their impact on Yemeni domestic politics. Last but not least, our moderator, Shedi Kobati, is the co-founder of Yemen's leading international NGO, Azala, which has been appointed as the official secretariat to the UK parliament. He's the first ever Yemeni to graduate from Yale College. And as Yale's Henry Fellow, he is now pursuing his MPhil in development studies at King's here in Cambridge, focusing on post-war economic recovery in Yemen. He is also the president of the Cambridge University Arab Society and the Yemen Society. Without further ado, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Tara. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Masakum Allah bil khair, ayyuhul azzaa, aw shukran ala hudurukum. I really hope you're all keeping well and are safe along with your loved ones, especially during those very, very trying times. And I'm delighted to, to welcome you all to our panel today. I'm firstly excited and very humbled to be moderating this panel with a distinguished set of politicians and academics in the world's oldest free speech and debating society. I'd like to thank them wholeheartedly for joining us today across eight time zones. On behalf of the Cambridge University Arab Society and the Cambridge University Yemen Society, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks and most sincere gratitude to Tara, Georgia and Iman, along with the rest of the union team for being incredible hosts and supporting with all the logistics without which we wouldn't have been able to convene today. Now, I know that it's, it's incredibly hard to concentrate on anything outside of the, of the US after all the madness that's been happening over the past uh, 72 hours across the pond. So I'll try and set the scene for our discussion <laughs> over the next hour. <laughs> Uh, there have been a number of, of talks on Yemen over the past few months, and we hosted a few of them where we spoke about the daunting humanitarian condition, uh, you know, Yemen being the worst humanitarian crisis we've witnessed since the Second World War, um, along with, of course, its social, political and economic implications. But as advertised uh, with this discussion, we're trying to go a step further, looking at the future. A few questions for all of us to think about over the next hour are, are we marching along the road of fragmentation or is there still light at the end of the tunnel? 
for some arrangement that can keep Yemen intact under a single union. With the former, are we speaking about a pre-1990 arrangement of secession or just complete disintegration? With the latter, what would be the best political entity to aspire to? Federalism, confederalism, or another political union? Just very quickly, logistically, um, I mean, if we were in the union's chamber in, in, in Cambridge, I would usually start with, there are no scheduled fire drills during this talk and the event of the emergency, you know, please use the exits located here and there. But for today's virtual discussion and under the climate of the UK's national lockdown, I'd urge you to remain with us for the whole hour, no matter what happens in what promises to be a rich, stimulating and thought provoking discussion. Structurally and for some housekeeping, our distinguished panelists have the first 20 minutes where each speaker will get five minutes to highlight their vision for Yemen's future. And Tara will kindly be monitoring the time for us playing a beep when we have 30 seconds to go for each speaker. Following that, I'll lead a moderating this, uh, moderated discussion uh, for 15 minutes, which will be more of a conversation. Then we'll finally reach the most exciting part of this discussion and have 15 minutes reserved for all of you to ask your questions. So please think of the questions throughout and post them on the forum that Tara referred to, which should be on the comment section. Um, we will both be closely monitoring the forum throughout the, the discussion to ensure that nothing is left behind and that all your questions are answered. Without further ado, let's kick it off with the opening remarks alphabetically by surname. Your Excellency, Dr. Nadia Saqqaf, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shadi, Tara, and the Cambodian and the Arab and Yemeni societies for organizing this event. Um, dear friends, let me start by saying that the national dialogue outcomes, which is the, uh, the topic that is dear to me and I'm most familiar with, is not going to lead to peace in Yemen. But once peace happens, and it will, one way or the other, Implementing the national dialogue outcomes are the only way to ensure its sustainability. Apparently, I am here to give you a magical solution and the answer to the future of Yemen. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the truth is that I have no idea how to practically reach peace in Yemen and what that Yemen will look like. In fact, I doubt anyone can claim that they have the one solution that can get us out of this mess that we put us, ourselves in. I'm saying this because the political dynamics of the current conflict have drastically changed since 2014, and therefore the political solutions provided by the national dialogue outcomes are not applicable today. This is a natural conclusion and does not take anything away from the credibility of the NDC and its outcomes. In order to reach a peace agreement to the current complex crisis, we need relevant and creative political solutions that take into account the changes in all the entities and the dynamics. For example, a peace deal should take into account the new parties that are uh, involved in the conflict and the stakeholders. Women should be part, in, an integral part of the peace building processes. What I can tell you is that when we have peace in Yemen eventually, and whatever that kind of peace and agreement for the future of Yemen, that the national dialogue outcomes are an amazing national resource that if implemented will put us on track to becoming one of the greatest nations, not only in the region, but I believe in the world. When we arrive to the peace agreement, if, when, one of the many misconceptions about the national dialogue outcomes or the national dialogue itself is that it was only purely political. In fact, only two of the nine working groups were purely political. These were the Southern Issue and the Sada working groups in which I witnessed firsthand the political maneuvers and the cunning deliberations that took place behind closed doors. The discussions were not genuine and many of the participants in those two groups did not have the best interest of the country in their hearts. Therefore, it honestly does not surprise me that many of the outcomes do not hold today. The selfish political entities to the conflict 
made a mockery of our national dialogue uh, that took part that took place between 2013 and 2014. So it does not concern me when they say that the political outcomes that they themselves were part of are not relevant or applicable. Agreed. As it is, it is their actions in the past that led us to today's suffering. And I recognize that new agreements have to be put in place. Furthermore, the controversial issues of the number of regions in the federal state, in the federal country and their borders were decided after the National Dialogue Conference was concluded. These were not part of the outcomes. What I'm here to tell you is that for nine months, more than 650 Yemenis, nearly 30% were women and 20% were youth, including some of the brightest and most dedicated minds in the country, put their heads together and created roadmaps for the future of Yemen, the Yemen that we are dreaming of. The NDC was about economy and development, freedoms and rights, state building, good governance, reforming the security and military sectors, reconciliation and transitional justice and independence of state entities. The thing is, the root cause of Yemen's conflict is bad management of resources, both natural and human. Yemen's humanitarian crisis started long ago before the, it is classified today as a humanitarian emergency. What Yemen should be classified is as a chronic crisis at the highest level. To address this long-standing crisis with the help of experienced professionals and experts, we took the opportunity to examine our past and our present in order to design our future. In the National Dialogue, we came up with solutions to fight corruption and, and ensure ethical management of resources. In the National Dialogue, we agreed on the basic human rights and principles and drafted directives to ensure equal citizenship and social justice. In the National Dialogue, we talked about the democratic systems that we aspire to and how adequately to separate between powers. In the National Dialogue, we talked about healing our community and recovering from the many grievances the nation was suffering from even before it was made in, 2000, in 1990. In the National Dialogue, we agreed on mechanisms for reforming security. We even talked about the environment even before Greta Thunberg came into light and before COVID-19. So please, when you talk about the NDC, do not say it's relevant. Do not dismiss it because the, political, the politics and the politicians have changed. Don't dare question the importance of the national dialogue to the future of the country. More than 1,800 outcomes are there and please take the chance to read it. However, if we want to ensure the future of Yemen is bright, regardless of the structure of that Yemen, we need to hold tight to these amazing outcomes and let them guide us to achieving the Yemen we all dream of. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. al Saqaf. I will now give the floor to Ambassador Feierstein. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shadi and Tara, and I want to thank the Cambridge Union I think I think we lost connection with Ambassador Feierstein. I cannot tell if he will resume or not. Um, for the meantime, just when he, he rejoins us, let us um, just give the floor to um, Dr. Frey Hat, if you are ready. Um, you have you have the floor, and then we'll, we'll come back to Ambassador Feierstein. Hopefully, he'll be able to to rejoin us. If you can please unmute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Shadi, and thank you, Cambridgeian, for uh, Antara and uh, for this uh, uh, gathering to uh, discuss uh, uh, Yemen and the Yemen future, uh, and to try to answer your question about uh, whether we're heading uh, towards fragmentation or there is still a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, let me begin with this: uh, is that there are three major factors that I, in my view, that are important uh, to look at when we try to answer this question. 
Um, unfortunately, these three factors do not help us uh, or do not give us, uh, you know, much hope uh, to think that there is uh, that the light at the end of the tunnel um, is is soon. Uh, the very first factor that we need to look at is that uh, there is a U.S. At the, looking at the regional and the international level, there is a U.S. retreat from the region, uh, whether during the Obama administration or Trump administration, and who knows, maybe now during the Biden administration. And this uh, U.S. retreat from the region is being, the vacuum it's created, is being filled by regional and international forces like uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, uh, and others. Uh, so this is a creating a regional rivalry uh, with the part of Yemen, especially between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, that existed a long time ago, but now it became uh, much worse, uh, turning Yemen um, into a battleground uh, between regional rivals. So I don't see how we can, or this conflict can be resolved uh, independently from this, the impact or the influence of region of this regional uh, dimension. And this reminds me actually with the crisis or, uh, you know, in uh, Lebanon, uh, that it turned to be a battleground as well for regional rivalry. And uh, that also perpetuated the crisis and the conflict there. The second important factor is to look at is that there is an ideological force in Sana'a, uh, the Houthis in particular, that they're strong, uh, there is, uh, uh, they have an ideological uh, ground uh, that they uh, build their political decisions and power on it, um, on one hand. And on the other hand, we have an opposition that's weak and in disarray, uh, which is creating this uh, also a major problem for uh, resolving or a, a major challenge for resolving the conflict there. Uh, uh, the third important factor that there is a huge failure, in my view, in the mismanagement of the war uh, in, in Yemen, and more importantly, the uh, very poor management of the reconstruction efforts in some parts of Yemen and lack of coordination uh, between uh, the different players uh, in Yemen. This lack of coordination that is leading, in my view, creating uh, uh, or, or is pushing towards uh, uh, what I call the de facto fragmentation or the de facto partition uh, in Yemen because, again, uh, of the lack of this uh, coordination uh, between the different players. So with this kind of formula, we are seeing many different players in Yemen, the Houthis, Iran, Saudi, United Arab Emirates, the uh, Iraq in the south, and uh, uh, the different uh, players in Marib and in the Hadramut with no minimum uh, level of coordination. So uh, this, to answer Shadi's question actually on uh, federalism or confederalism, Federalism and confederalism needs coordination, needs minimum level of uh, minimum levels of agreements. This does this is not the case in Yemen. There are many different players that are playing or working uh, independently from each other, um, and that's why I'm a bit pessimistic about this, uh, leading to uh, again the de facto partition or de facto fragmentation. Nevertheless, I think there is still uh, to, to have some hope uh, uh, you know, for us when we look at Yemen. I think there are still three opportunities that we can look at positively. Uh, so we can uh, end with good, uh, with hope uh, for the assessment of the situation. Uh, I think uh, a, a Saudi Houthis deal uh, to end uh, the conflict in Yemen I think this can give us hope. I know this is difficult, but I think it's not impossible uh, to do this. And I agree here with Dr. Nadia Sakaf uh, is that the national dialogue uh, cannot create peace, but once there is a deal, I think this can help us um, in order to proceed with, uh, with peace in Yemen. And this takes me to the next 
uh, or the second uh, opportunity that we can look at, uh, or that that is possible to avoid this de facto fragmentation, which is on the intra-party level uh, within Yemen in particular. Uh, in particular, the Houth is leading uh, an intra-party dialogue. Uh, to reach out to the uh, other political parties and to try to work out something within Yemen, independently from the regional uh, factors and from the regional impact on that level, uh, uh, the Houthis are uh, they, they can they can build on the national dialogue here, and the national dialogue uh, outcomes provide us with good opportunity uh, to try to work out something there. So. Um, I think here also there is a there is a potential where if it's used uh, probably with uh, with good intentions, I think this can help us avoid the de facto fragmentation. And the third opportunity I think uh, is that we have a change in the uh, in Washington D.C. Possibly we still don't know the results for sure. We see that there is a possible change of administration in Washington. Uh, with the Biden administration, uh, possibly again, um, I think we could expect a different management uh, of uh, the Yemen war from Washington coming out if um, a Democrat administration ends up being in the White House. Um, and with this kind of administration, I think there will be um, an intention to try to avoid this humanitarian crisis. The man-made humanitarian crisis is, that has been created in Yemen, uh, with to try with an intention, a good intention and good effort to try to put an end to the war. Which again, I think, if it's uh, if we can use this potential, uh, can also help us uh, try to uh, take an, to, to take an opportunity and to try to avoid the de facto fragmentation and to try to work out or to manage things differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhat, uh, for that intervention. I see that now we have Ambassador uh, Firestein with us. Welcome back. Uh, the next five minutes are yours, sir. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Shadi, and uh, apologies for the interruption. I think it was Donald Trump interfering with the signal. Um, uh, let me begin by acknowledging that the situation in Yemen is far more complex and difficult than it was uh, during the Arab Spring period when, uh, when I was in Sana'a, uh, when there did appear to be a consensus among uh, the majority of Yemenis on a way forward, perhaps not in the details of, uh, of a agreement, uh, but certainly in the broad sense that the country needed a change from the era of Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, and that there was a window of opportunity uh, to address the fundamental issues that had challenged Yemenis for decades. Uh, in particular, those issues, in my view, included the political marginalization and the economic disenfranchisement that had plagued Yemen at least since the dawn of the modern era in the 1960s. Uh, beyond that, there were the additional challenges of resolving the legitimate grievances of the South, as well as addressing the concerns of the Houthis and their supporters uh, in the North of the North. Uh, the GCC initiative and implementing mechanism, uh, which fundamentally reflected the views and the input of the Yemenis themselves, attempted to provide a roadmap for addressing these issues, including the National Dialogue Conference that was intended to provide a voice to those Yemenis who had been marginalized and shut out of leadership positions for decades. Uh, while I believe that there has not been a thorough and legitimate review of the NDC's 1600 recommendations to decide whether those uh, NDC uh, uh, recommendations succeeded in defining a workable way forward, it's clear that Yemen will need to revisit and revise its findings down the road uh, to reflect the new circumstances that have arisen. Uh, in particular, it's clear today that the civil conflict that erupted in 2014 is no longer a binary contest uh, between the Houthis and the Hadi government with their external supporters. Uh, but 
but instead the country is more fractured than ever before, uh, not only between the North and the South, uh, but within those uh, former political structures uh, that uh, go even beyond the major conflict. There are now a number of smaller conflicts. Uh, there's been the rise of a war economy uh, that will be difficult to end uh, and increasingly independent governance, uh, uh, governorates as well as local and tribal elements uh, that will resist returning to the previous centralized government. Therefore, I believe that there needs to be a phased approach to ending the conflict and returning Yemen to a path of legitimate and sustainable governance. Uh, to begin with, uh, I believe that there needs to be an end to the major fighting uh, between the Houthis and the government. Uh, this is something that uh, will be under the leadership of the United Nations, uh, and there needs to be an agreement on a political process that would establish a new transitional government for Yemen. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, once that's in place, there needs to be an urgent effort to address the immediate needs of the Yemeni people, especially ensuring that humanitarian relief uh, reaches all of those in need and restores basic government services, especially health and education. A third, I think that we need to begin to address the broader issues of law and order through rebuilding uh, Yemen's security agencies. Uh, fourth, uh, recognizing that there are some 40% of Yemenis who are dependent on government payments, uh, either through salaries or welfare checks, uh, we need to reestablish those payments immediately uh, to uh, prime the pump for a restoration of economic activity in the country. Uh, and then fifth, uh, we need to promote restoration of the broader uh, Yemeni economy. Uh, those are the five urgent steps that I think that need to be taken before we turn uh, to any other, uh, any other elements of the overall situation. At that point, once we've addressed those five steps, uh, there needs to be an effort to address again the underlying political, economic, and social issues, uh, beginning with an evaluation of the recommendations of the National Dialogue Conference. And here I agree completely uh, with Dr. Sakaf. Uh, I think that that needs to be the starting point for any further evaluation. Uh, th there needs to be a decision on that basis of what additional work might need to be taken uh, in order to achieve a framework uh, for making further progress and making the adjustments that we uh, need to make. Uh, and then finally, once there is a successful conclusion of uh, a new and, and revised National Dialogue Conference, uh, we can then turn our attention uh, to uh, uh, the possibility of new elections uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and that would uh, once again end the, uh, the political transition process that began in 2011 uh, and, uh, and restore uh, finally security and governance for the country. So all of those are issues that primarily uh, fall on the shoulders of the Yemeni people, uh, but there should be no question that the international community also will have an essential role to play in supporting this Yemeni-led process. Uh, in particular, the international community, especially the GCC states and the Friends of Yemen, uh, will need to provide assistance for the reconstruction effort uh, that's going to need to be taken and institutional capacity building that I think is an important part of any sustainable resolution of the conflict. Uh, and then finally, uh, in addition to that, the GCC states uh, need to be in the lead uh, in promoting Yemeni economic development, uh, including providing Yemeni membership in the GCC and access to the larger GCC economies. Uh, so those are, are my comments and thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Feierstein. Thank you, Excellency. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing they ended on that note and that's what I'll be focusing my, my dissertation on this year in terms of how to incorporate Yemen into the uh, GCC, starting economically. Um, but last but not least, um, we have with us here, uh, Mr. Gilad Maktari. You have the floor, sir.
I believe you might still be muted. Go for it, Mr. Maktari. We can hear you. Can you? Well, one of the disadvantages of being the last speaker is that the previous speakers have left you nothing to speak about. <laughs> but obviously, I agree with uh, a great deal of what has been said. And many of these uh, have been in my mind anyhow. Uh, I would like to use the analogy of the Ramsey kitchen nightmare. If any of you know that program, where there are so many cooks in the Yemeni kitchen, and each one is using their own uh, program or their own meal project, as well as the uh, agendas. There's no doubt that the Yemenis have almost came to a, uh, a decent arrangement through the national dialogue, as Dr. Uh, Nadia said. Uh, but that was spoiled immediately. Now, the history of Yemen uh, is full of cycles of violence. Um, Almost every 10 years, there is something going on, uh, wars and so on. And in most cases, in most of these uh, cases or events, there's always external powers that are playing around. Uh, hegemonic power, yeah. Uh, in After the uh, 1962 revolution for the Republic, the Saudis were hard at work with the Republicans, uh, sorry, with the Royalists, and Nasser from Egypt was with the uh, Republicans and so on. There's a lot of other events that happened. Few heads of states have been killed, including Al Hamdi and, and so on. Uh, and then we have uh, that nightmare. Ali Abdullah Saleh for 33 years in which he used the, the country as if it is his own fiefdom, uh, granting uh, uh, favors to his cronies and to a variety of other people and so on. Now, we then reached the Arab Spring and the Yemeni uprising, which was uh, unbelievable, especially the, the way that the uh, women came out for the first time in, in millions, hundreds of thousands, uh, young tribal uh, personnel came out in defiance of their heads and so on. And uh, here we then get the GCC to come in and produce the, uh, they produce the, uh, the solution, if you like. Now that solution was uh, that Ali Abdullah Saleh goes, and then there is Hadi, who was the only candidate in any election seen in the world. Right, but he came in, and then there was the dialogue and all that. Uh, and we thought at one stage that we're almost there, but for some reason or another, another foreign power started to meddle in, or regional power. And I'm thinking here about Iran, yeah. Uh, and then there was the their proxies the Houthis, and the, in the south, there were the uh, uh, separatists, right? Now, in all this, or the current situation is that in all these 
components, whether they are in the north, in the south, or even amongst the uh, alliance, the Arab alliance, you know, Saudis, the uh, Iranian, uh, the uh, Emiratis, and so on. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of contradiction. And that is not allowing the situation to, uh, you know, progress in many ways. Every time you, it's like fighting fire. Yeah, you, you try and stop it somewhere, or you start somewhere else, and so on. Uh, I think the the subject you, that you have put in, the subject that you have put in, is is very very interesting. But it's very it's a little bit unfair in the sense that it's very very difficult to to answer yeah uh, like all most of the speakers have said there's so many elements that's got to get together yeah and so on and without the goodwill of the uh, external powers mainly the superpowers then I'm afraid uh, the Yemenis will just continue into jumping from one cycle of violence to another. Uh, that's not my hope. Uh, I hope it never happens. But it is a fact, and we must not escape from that. Yeah? And so uh, we don't know what's going to happen once uh, Biden comes in. I'm not saying that the the Democrats are going to change the their foreign policy altogether, but at least it probably will be less abrasive than uh, it used to be with Trump. And it is quite possible that there may be some kind of settlement, not just for Yemen, but for the whole region. People are getting tired of the fight between the Gulf states uh, the, and Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, and so on. So we don't know what is going actually to happen. Uh, we hope it will produce an atmosphere of trying to, uh, you know, trying to calm things down and sort things in a, uh, or, or problems in, you know, in a more civilized way. But for the moment, I don't know how much that could uh, help the Yemenis come out of the tunnel, really. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Maktari, for your uh, for your key insight. Um, I agree with you. It's a very very difficult question, but difficult quest but, but difficult solutions, as they say, need difficult questions to be answered, and that's what we're here to do today to to do something different than than what we than pounds we had in the past. But thank you for your uh, interventions. I have some questions, and I took some notes, but um, I'd open it to uh, to 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 you, speakers, if if you have questions for each other. Perfect. Go for it. Go for it, uh, Dr. Al Sakaf. Uh, and I thought I, I was confused. It turns out everybody is confused. Um, so, so here it is. Let me, let me frame the next 10 minutes, if you allow me. So we've got the structure of the Yemen that we're talking about now. We're not saying how to get to peace, because that's complex. And we're not saying, what do we do after we get the peace? We're saying, how will this new state look like? Now, on the one hand, we've got the fragmentation and separate entities. On the other hand, we've got the central country. We know this, we can no longer go to, to the central state. So this is off the table. We know that fragmentation is also a very disadvantage because to start with, it takes more than having your own flag to say that you can have a country. I mean, you need to have physical entities, you need to have economic entities, you need to have structures, you need to have international relations. There's just so much institutions. It's not just a, a wish. And, uh, and there are so many internal fragmentations within the 1994, uh, 1990 borders that 
tell us, as Yemenis, we know we can no longer go back to the North Yemen, South Yemen situation. So it could either be four Yemens. And then when you talk about the four Yemens, or regardless of their names, because some people say we do not even claim that we are Yemen. We are al Janub al-Arabi. We are the southern um, part of the, uh, the Arab South. So it's just not realistic from um, a strategic point of view to say that we will have independent states. We could have some sort of autonomy, local autonomy, uh, decentralized, heavily decentralized rule. Is that a confederal situation or is it a federal situation? There are differences in between those two. It depends on, I mean, you all know. So my question to you all here, what is it? Is it possible to have like a um, somewhat a confederate state for Yemen with three or four, with maybe six regions or six entities, or is it a federal state with uh, decentralization? So, what are these differences for our audiences, and which is the likely scenario that will keep Yemen? as one Yemen, but with very strong autonomic and local rules. Any takers? I see Jerry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, you know, throw my oar in. I, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think that the issue of, you know, whether it should be federal or confederal is really uh, only a question of how strong uh, you want the central government to be, and uh, is it uh, you know six uh, separate Yemeni, uh, Yemens that are loosely associated with one another, but basically manage their own affairs, or do you have a central government that's capable of providing uh, leadership on security issues, on foreign policy, uh, and also in terms of the management of some of these uh, some of the other basic functions of a government? Uh, but with the understanding that you'll have a strong level of local autonomy uh, and decentralization so that while the central government is there, you have a ministry of education, you have a ministry of health, uh, but nevertheless, basic decisions about how to manage the affairs of that particular region are really left to the people themselves. And I think that we have actually uh, some good examples of what happens uh, right now, when uh, the uh, the governorates are left uh, really to manage their own affairs, I think if you look at Madrid, if you look at Al Jalf, uh, there are very positive uh, uh, elements of what they've been able to do for themselves over these past uh, over these past uh, uh, years, uh, and I think that perhaps that's a model for the way to go forward into the future. Uh, but I do think, I mean, if, if, if it's not up to me, I'm not a Yemeni, uh, but I would say that, you know, from a perspective of, of the United States, uh, we would, uh, I think, much prefer to see uh, a federal system with a strong uh, central government that could take responsibility for uh, the security issues and some of the other issues uh, that, you know, again, Yemen faces tremendous difficulties. It faces an issue, and I think that you mentioned it yourself, Nadia, uh, about the, uh, the development of natural resources and how does that work? I think much easier in a federal system than in a confederal system. Uh, and then the security issues and some of the other issues. Uh, so, um, you know, that would be the way that I would go. That's of course the way, as you know better than anyone, the, the way that the National Dialogue Conference came out. Uh, and I would uh, say again, as I think we agreed, that the first step needs to be in evaluating how to move forward to take a look at those recommendations that the NDC made in 2013 and 2014. Thank you, Ambassador. I think you, know, you highlight the role of, of looking back and, and looking at those you know, key outcomes that you know, have taken so long to, to establish and involved, uh, as Dr. Renadia mentioned, uh, many, many stakeholders. Um, I have I have a couple of questions. I will move to to, to uh, I'll add to this uh, discussion. You know, talk over national reconciliation and, and justice. Um, and I'd like to to involve Dr. Frehat here. Um, I'd like to you know 
just a few uh, quote a few sentences from 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 your book here from 2016 on the um unfinished revolutions i i promise i am not uh just quoting the book because it's yale press uh but um just you know two very interesting uh paragraphs there or just a couple of lines um because i want to to ask you for a comment in light of what ambassador firestein mentioned so here you say uh despite these challenges speaking about yemen's challenges challenges um there is still room to salvage Yemen's transitional and national reconciliation. We must discard the idea that a coup can achieve a peaceful political transition. A coup cannot exist with a genuine and inconclusive transition or effective national reconciliation. And then you add, you end the chapter, Dr. Freyhat, with Yemen's political process under the GCC initiative compromised justice for peace in order to facilitate Saleh's departure in 2011. Finally, Compromising justice should never be the case again. Saleh has no place in the future of Yemen and his political role should end immediately. Of course, this was written in, in 2016 before his, his death by Babayir, but just bringing in now the, the, the role of, of national um, reconciliation to this, how does that happen? We had you know, one figurehead there with Saleh. Now we have so many stakeholders, so many different, you know, probably a dozen I could count at the top of my head who are very much involved in, in, in Yemen's affairs. So how do you deal with that transitional justice, Dr. Freyhat? I think you're just on mute. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shadi, uh, for taking me back to what I wrote in 2016. And uh, luckily, I still stick to what I wrote in 2016 uh, and insist that uh, one of the major shortcomings of the GCC initiative was is to leave uh, Saleh as part of uh, the the political process in Yemen, uh, when he played uh, the role of the head of the political of the of his political party, uh, and continued uh, along with others to sabotage the transition process, and I still strongly, even more today, stick to the uh, justice as a central uh, a central uh, dimension for uh, national reconciliation in Yemen to take a place, because without that, I don't think we can ever achieve a genuine lasting uh, peace in Yemen or in other places uh, in, uh, uh, because we have also the example of uh, uh, Lebanon and the Taif Agreement in 1989 uh, that compromised justice as well. And look where Yemen, where Lebanon is today, uh, 30 years after that. So this is what you get when you compromise and uh, surrender justice for, uh, for a deal making or peace deal making uh, as a result. Uh, uh, and here, uh, I, I, I thank you for this because also this links to uh, Dr. Sakaf's uh, question and the framing of the discussion. Uh, and also to record my opposition to the confederalism uh, because let's not hide behind terms uh, thinking that confederalism is a solution. Confederalism, confederalism is a fragmentation. Right, not nothing else. You know, it's two different states. And by the way, we don't need a, a peace deal for this. It will emerge by itself if we eventually lead, end up with different uh, three or four states uh, uh, in different parts of Yemen. These different uh, four states, when they are established, they will find a way to co to collaborate among themselves, and we can then call it confederalism. I don't think this is the route or this is the path we should do or we should take in Yemen. We should stick again uh, to the major principles. We know uh, the solutions. We know the national dialogue that uh, Dr. Sakaf and Jerry also mentioned and emphasized and uh, uh, Dr. Jalal as a, as a way forward. And here to add to this, uh, Shadi, is that what I would like to propose is, uh, is, to, to, is to go to the next level of national dialogue is to build on the national dialogue that ended there, um, ended back before the war, and move to the next level. That with a national, with a serious national dialogue within the within the Yemenis themselves, I think there is a hope, you know, to salvage the entire process. Because also I think the Houthis are tired of the war, and um, again, and here going to the conflict resolution theory of the mutually hurting stalemate. I think all parties are mutually hurting now. And this could provide actually the right moment uh, for us to intervene and to try to, to build a solution. We should not rush into confederalism. We should take national dialogue to the next level 
build, learn from the mistakes of compromising justice, I think we can, there is room to build or to go to the next level and then start talking about a federal Yemen rather than that, that can uh, keep Yemen together rather than confederalism, which is a mass, uh, a mass uh, fragmented Yemen, the way I would, uh, that I can put it. I see you unmuted, uh, Mr. Maqtari. Any comments? Yeah, I would like to ask, actually, uh, Dr. Farhad, uh, about what he thinks is going to happen in the Gulf region in particular. I have two scenarios. One is that uh, there, there may be some kind of accommodation between the Gulf states, uh, particularly the lifting of the uh, punishment or on, on uh, Qatar, as well as <coughs> a peace amongst all the other ones. One. The other scenario I have is that there may be an all-out war in the Gulf, in which major powers will be involved. Yeah? Unless, of course, uh, the American, the new American uh, administration tends to calm things down. In that case, whether this scenario or the other scenario, its effect on Yemen is definitely going to be uh, very big. What does he think? Just before Dr. Uh, Frehat answers yes. that question, I'd like to say he wrote a book. I don't know if, if you wrote it, if you read it. Uh, I think it came out in, in February, and I'm just you know bringing this up so you don't have Dr. Frehat to self-publicize. But it's called Iran and, and Saudi Arabia taming a, a chaotic conflict, and I think you, exp you explore a lot of, of those very interesting dimensions. But um, I'd, I'd love to hear your your response to uh, Mr. Mokhtari's question. Thank you. I don't also. Uh, I don't. I don't want to mon monopolize the, the, the time and discussion. But very briefly, I think uh, in terms of relevance to Yemen, uh, the major thing uh, could come from um, uh, an Iran-Saudi rivalry. Uh, I think that uh, that's what could spill over. What had, what has spilled over in Yemen and impacted the whole situation in Yemen. Uh, the war in the in the Gulf, I think it's much, much, much less likely with a new administration uh, now that's likely to be uh, with a Biden administration. The reckless uh, U.S. administration, Trump administration is over uh, with the change of the administration. So we'll, we will be seeing more regulated foreign policy that follows uh, international Rome, uh, norms rather than that, that one. So I so this is where I go back again to the Iran-Saudi rivalry and the impact, the major impact on Yemen. So uh, I think that could provide if we are able to have a breakthrough there. Again, looking at the uh, new uh, U.S. administration that's not fully driven by arms sales, is it driven by uh, uh, the uh, capitalizing on the international norm and international order, I think there is an opportunity with the new administration is to try to strike some sort of uh, a regional solution uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which will be directly reflected or will, will directly reflect itself on Yemen. And that's where I think a political solution could help. Go for it, Dr. Um, Ambassador Furstein. Yeah, if I could just uh, uh, jump in, uh, I, I agree <coughs> entirely with uh, Dr. Freyhardt. Uh, I think a, a few things. One, assuming that we do have a Biden administration, I would anticipate that um, uh, that they will, uh, in the case of Yemen, uh, look uh, uh, to be more of an actor in trying to press, uh, particularly on the UN uh, uh, negotiations, uh, to uh, to do more. The uh, Trump administration was willing to really uh, kind of seed. Uh, decision making on, on policy in the in the Arabian Peninsula and the, and the region uh, to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi. I think that uh, Biden administration is going to be less inclined to do that. Uh, the other thing that I think is significant is that uh, regardless of uh, whether it's uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, uh, the reality from my perspective is that the Gulf states were already in the process of trying to uh, reduce tensions with Iran, uh, particularly the UAE, 
uh, uh, which used its decision to withdraw from Yemen uh, as a way of signaling to the Iranians that they wanted to uh, to uh, lower the intensity of their uh, of their uh, confrontation. I think that uh, that the Gulf states, particularly the Saudis and the Emiratis, were perfectly happy to see the U.S. and Iran in a in a in a greater confrontation. But what they didn't want to see happen was a conflict uh, in the region, understanding perfectly well that they would be the most likely victims of any open war between the United States and Iran. So when things were getting too tense, uh, they uh, decided to pull back a little bit and to uh, lower the temperature in the region. I think that if the U.S. does play a more active role in uh, trying to drive some of these issues and a Biden administration asserts um, uh, U.S. interests more aggressively in the region than the Trump administration did, uh, then I think that that might open doors uh, for some kind of an accommodation on Yemen uh, simply because the Iranians will feel less threatened and more confident about, about uh, backing away from some of their positions. Uh, but that is, of course, pure supposition on our part. A lot will depend on what happens in the Iranian elections that are due next spring. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Feierstein. Um, I'd like now to involve our audience and um, thank you so much to, to the audience for asking questions. I'll try and, and ask them throughout, um, Within, within themes, just so that um, we don't run out of time. I think it's very relevant to what we've been discussing. So um, we have here two questions speak, you know, asking about the role of, 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 of foreign players. So um, the first question says, you know, should Yemen seek Western intervention to resolve the conflicts? The West's track record of intervention has been abysmal so far in the Middle East, for example, Syria. And a closely related question to that, um, and, and any of you could 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 could, could answer this. Uh, the second part, uh, the second question here: the struggle in Yemen is a conflict between British interests versus American interests. This struggle has been in the Middle East since after the Second World War, after America came out of isolation. As Miles Copeland had stated in his book, The Game Player, the regional players and international players are only pawns in a bigger game. What's your comment? Um, any any takers? For, for those two related questions? I'll, I'll, um, I'll respond very briefly to the first point. Uh, I'll leave the second one alone. Uh, but on the, on the first point, uh, I would just say that one of the differences between Yemen and Syria is that, um, is that there is not a great power conflict in the Yemen situation. And one of the, uh, one of the reasons why the international community was relatively successful in its intervention in Yemen in 2011 and 2012 is that uh, the UN Security Council, the, uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council were all in agreement about Yemen. There was no, uh, uh, nobody saw Yemen as being a national, uh, a national interest. And so therefore, uh, we were all able to work together in a fairly positive and constructive way. I don't think that has changed. I think that that, that, uh, uh, that opportunity uh, for international cooperation in resolving the Yemen conflict is still there. And therefore, I'm reasonably hopeful that under the right set of circumstances, uh, the Security Council can pull together and uh, help promote a resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, there is a question we have here on the forum. Uh, given the bleak future of Yemen and also the disastrous conditions, COVID, poverty, uh, poverty sorry, lack of resources, malaria, is this a top-down approach? How do, you, uh, in, how do you get involved within citizenry? And who are the key elements in, in, in the National Dialogue? I guess probably referencing the, the National Dialogue Conference and probably Dr. Al-Saqqaf when, when you mentioned that we have to involve the new parties and new stakeholders in any future discussions. So maybe, maybe you'd be willing to, to answer that question. I have said it before and I'm saying it again. The solution to Yemen is local. We mm -hmm. need to want to have peace we need to want to fix our country. And the, the examples that uh, Ambassador Gerald has uh, said about Mare, Baljof, and to an extent Hadramot is actually very relevant to the answer to this question. 
local governance, good governance at the local level can create a solution to the, all the miseries that we're talking about, whether it is poverty or health crisis and so on. So it's economy, but it's local economy. It's not a, a blanket solution for the entire country. And by empowering the local institutions to deal with their own issues and give them the resources and the autonomy they need, that will take Yemen forward. Thank you, Dr. Al-Faqaf. We have another question here on the, on, on the floor. Um, is it not becoming increasingly obvious that the realities on the ground are such that's inevitable that paving the way forward for reunification is the quickest way to ending the suffering? Any, any takers? I see you laughing there, <laughs> Mr. Maqtari. Any, any comments on that one? Really, it's just, um, it's wishful thinking, really, in many ways. Uh, how can you, after all this fragmentation that has occurred and the intervention of all these external players, yeah, how can you go back to unity? Unity can only be uh, brought about by the people themselves. Uh, in uh, in the 1990, in 1990, the two uh, states, you know, the southern states, BDRY and North Yemen, Saleh, they decided they will uh, get together and have a unity. It wasn't pushed by external elements or whatever. There may have been some, but the main thing is that it came from within. Now, lots of things have gone wrong since that time. And it may also be the basis uh, that these things have gone wrong uh, because Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, he uh, treated the South as a victor's uh, prize, if you like. Yeah? And uh, as a result of that, uh, it created a lot of uh, resentment for that kind of unity, which led again to uh, secession and then again to a war of reunification. That reunification was uh, by force, really, and it was unfair uh, on the southern people and so on. So, really, uh, reuniting Yemen will require, as I said, and as most of you have said, that it is. Uh, something that has to come to eliminate from within the people themselves. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Maqdari. I think we have a final question here on the forum. And if there aren't any other questions, uh, as, as moderator, I'll ask one final question I'm, I'm very curious about. So here it says, in the discussion of rebuilding Yemeni government and international presence, what place will the current and historical social structure of tribalism have in that process? Tribal politics, especially in more rural areas, is strong and influences decisions at many levels. Is there a place for it in the new and improved Yemen? Is it really a problem as some paint it to be? Can I answer that? I'll, 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 give, I'll, I'll give the floor to uh, Dr. Frehat. He raised his hand and then I'll... I'll okay, come okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, also, I would like to hear what uh, Dr. Maktari has to say about this also. <laughs> but uh, uh, just to be fair with the tribalism, I know that uh, there is this uh, negative uh, reputation all the time about uh, federalism and how uh, dysfunctional it can be uh, in in a modern state uh, or in building on state building, uh, and of course, I mean uh, uh, federalism poses a challenge uh, to uh, certain aspects of uh, uh, reconstruction. But at, at the same time, I think uh, we cannot ignore uh, the importance or the uh, you know the role that uh, tribalism can play in Yemen and in rebuilding, especially on the security factor. I think there is probably one of the remaining uh, 
structural forces that uh, has not been strongly affected by the current war is the tribalism and the fact that there is tribalism is you know is everywhere uh, and let's also not forget the traditional uh, uh, role that tribalism played uh, in the political uh, structure of uh, of Yemen so i think there is there is definitely a potential that we can tap into this and can help uh, in uh, in a reconstruction process uh, especially in, uh, in in a society like Yemen and uh, the presence the strong presence of, uh, of tribalism i know it has been uh, marginalized especially in the uh, especially with the houthis a strong government in the houthis like has taken uh, over in in sana'a but uh, in not in any way i see that uh, the the presence of the houthis has eliminated uh, the role of uh, tribalism in the structural uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the society. It could have been marginalized, yes, but not eliminated. And I think there is a potential that we can tap into this and, uh, and use it to, for uh, a solution and reconstruction, successful reconstruction. Thank you. Do you have a very brief comment, uh, Mr. Maktari, or shall I just ask the, uh, the last question? Well, it depends on your time, you know. But we're running, <laughs> we're, we're running, we're running out of time. So let me put well, this. I, I agree with Dr. Freha about tribalism and the problems related to federalism and so on. But there are two simple things I want to say about tribalism. I think tribalism as a social structure and tribalism as a political Thing. Now, social structure, tribalism has kept the Yemen virtually united within their own areas, if you like, and even self-sufficient uh, most of the time, because they produce their own food, they, uh, they even produce uh, surplus for governments to take through and so on, uh, and also to resolve problems amongst themselves and so on. But then the side, the other side, the political side, mm -hmm. is where tribalism or tribal, certain tribes have been used by external factors. And this goes back in history. My research into the ancient period suggests that, the, the, that many tribes have formed themselves into militias in the service of the power to be at the time, and so on. And I think the same thing. There is something called in uh, Yemen, Ma'aman uh, Ghalab, uh, which means that the, the, the tribes will wait and see who's about to win, and then they, they'll jump in, and so on. So there are two different issues. I don't think Tribalism should be seen in this negative sense. In fact, the opposite. It's a, it right, strengthens the, the whole society and so on. But unfortunately, it's also been used. I mean, the Saudis used to pay the heads of, uh, of tribes uh, regular salaries, you know, and so on, in order to, to keep their uh, allegiance and so on. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maktari. I think it's, it's really lovely. We started on the regional, international level. We're now going as locally as speaking to, about the tribes. And I'd like to end it as well by going to the broader, of course, um, with the U.S. elections happening. I'd like to link a, a question that was asked on the YouTube um, comments, speaking about, you know, what happens if um, apparently if Trump wins another term, which I personally think is, is extremely unlikely. But I'll pose a question uh, for the sake of honesty. What are the key differences between the prospective approaches of, of Biden and Trump moving forward? But I also want to link to that the role of the United Nations. It's been heavily criticized over the years, especially the UN Security Council. Um, as you know, you all know, Yemen was, you know, the UN Resolution 2216, you know, was under, cha under Chapter 7 of the United Nations. And even then, many people feel that the Security Council has let down Yemen. So in terms of, you know, the role of a future, U.S. administration plus the role of a future United Nations for, for Yemen. And I think we'll have to um, end it there. Do we have any, any, any takers? I would just say uh, uh, very, uh, very quickly, Shadi, 
um, you know, the, the, I think the fundamental difference between the way a Biden administration versus a Trump administration will, uh, will uh, take on this issue. As I mentioned earlier, I think that the Trump administration was, was uh, more inclined to outsource uh, decision-making on Yemen uh, to uh, the Saudis, to the Emiratis. Uh, they were perfectly willing to go along with uh, the, the Saudi initiative. I think if you uh, if you want to think through how a Biden administration will uh, will manage this, uh, you should go back to the uh, to the last uh, weeks and months of the Obama administration. I think that there's a likelihood that uh, that Biden administration will pick up from that. I remember that John Kerry was very much involved in trying to uh, support the UN initiative. Uh, to uh, to get a political resolution, uh, in fact, had even uh, put forward some ideas uh, on his own uh, to try to push the process forward. I think that you're more likely to see that kind of engagement again uh, from a Biden administration. There is bipartisan interest, and this is important because if we do end up with a, uh, a Republican-controlled uh, Senate, and the administration, they'll probably be looking for areas where they can agree. I think that there is a bipartisan agreement on Yemen on the importance of resolving the conflict in Yemen, addressing the humanitarian crisis there. Uh, and therefore, there's a likelihood that uh, the Biden administration might see this as a low hanging fruit, if you will, of something that they might accomplish in the region. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think we'll have to leave it there. Since we are uh, running out of time, uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for engaging so openly with this topic with an open heart. I think I learned so much from every single one of you, uh, from Dr. Al Saqaf's Creative Solutions and taking into account new parties and stakeholders, and always keeping in mind the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference, to Ambassador Feierstein's phased approach to ending the conflict and returning Yemen to a path of legitimate running, and the five key steps for that, uh, to Dr. Freyhat, of course mentioning that it's hard to speak about federalism and confederalism without a minimum level of stability. Otherwise, we face um, de facto fragmentation, and we should also take the national dialogue to the next level, NDC 2.0. Uh, and last but not least, to Mr. Maktari, who uh, put it all together, spoke about the Gordon Ramsay program and all the cooks we have in Yemen. We hope that this will conclude with a productive meal. It goes without saying that my thanks is extended to you for being a wonderful audience and for engaging and asking uh, pertinent questions. Please follow our social media pages on, on Facebook and Instagram, the Cambridge Arab Society and the Cambridge German Society to hear about our forthcoming events. We look forward to seeing as many of you uh, in exactly a week at 6 p.m. GMT for our forthcoming event, uh, which I will be blessed to moderate as well. And that will be the official UK book launch of Ahmed Badr's book, While the Earth Sleeps, We Travel, which is a diverse and moving collection of stories, poems, and artwork from displaced youth across the world. And please remember to RSVP on the Eventbrite link, which you'll find on our social media pages. Finally, I'd like to thank the Cambridge Union for having us today. And thank you, Tara, for being there. And I will give you the final word. Hi, thank you all so much. Thank you, Shethi. Thank you to all our panelists. I feel like our audience really learned a lot and we had some really great audience participation in this panel. And I give my thanks to the Cambridge University Arab and Yemen Societies. Just from us at the Union, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, for more content and look at our Facebook and our Instagram. We have three events coming up next week at the Union. The first is our Hawking Fellow, Dr. Jane Goodall, um, on November 9th, which is this Monday. And I'd like to point out that auditions for our Remembrance and Church debates are open. Our Remembrance debate will be on November 10th on Tuesday, and our Church debate will be on November 12th on Thursday. And if you'd like to audition for that, just pop over to the Cambridge Union Members Group. and We hope to see you there. Again, thank you so, so much for bearing with us as we move completely online. And thank you again to all of our speakers for being willing to have such a productive discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bye-bye.